sitcoms were important to you growing up, I not just them. the Golden Girls. No, no, no. I yeah. loved TV. TV was my best friend, you know? I We grew up poor. My mom couldn't afford a babysitter, so TV was my babysitter. TV was my best friend. And sitcoms, I grew up loving the Golden Girls, Roseanne. You know, there, there were just so many stories. People didn't look like me, but we had the same stories. Hmm. And that was, I think, what really blew me away was the fact that I was Mexican, they weren't Mexican, and we still had the same struggle. How cool is that? You know, hmm. how great is that? It, it, to me, TV always showed me that as different as we were, we were always so much alike, you know? It's interesting, though, because the sitcom, I love sitcoms growing yeah. up, too, but that sitcom life can be so idyllic. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it can resonate. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, because the thing is, is that you always strive for the, you always strive for the positive. You always try, you know, no one ever wants the negative. It's like, I hope I'm broke tomorrow, you know? And, and for me, sitcoms always showed that life could be good. You know, I didn't realize that my family was so poor at the beginning of my life. Because as a kid, you always think that your life is what everybody's life is like. You know, mm -hmm. your reality is everybody's reality. It wasn't until I was in my 20s when I was in L.A. telling people about my life or one of my friends was like, ah, you were poor. <laughs> Girl, I hate to, like, bubble burst, you were poor. I'm like, what? And then I had that, like, fight club moment where I, like, started realizing <laughs> that I'm Tyler Durden. You know what I mean? Like, it was just that, I'm like, oh, my God, I was poor. Was everybody else the same around you? Is that why when you were growing everybody, up? Everybody was poor. Mm -hmm. We were the poor of the poor. Like, so, you know, so describe what it was. That thing. It was where, a border you know, town, right? You border lived, town yeah. uh, called San Juan, Texas, right next to Mexico. Uh, literally, all you had to do uh, now there's a street light. You cross the street light, and boom, you're in Mexico. So um, my the first seven the first seven eight years of my life, we lived in this abandoned diner. We were squatters. So my mom uh, my mom uh, left my my father. She was a Catholic. She couldn't divorce him. So she ended up leaving him and hiding from him to not go back to him. And wow. she found this abandoned diner. And she raised four kids in that abandoned diner. She worked at a, at a restaurant washing dishes. She used to make $100 a week, which was nothing. And uh, we used to have, you know, we had no electricity. So she would borrow, uh, she, we had an orange extension cord that we would uh, pay the neighbors to. Like she would pay them like 20, 30 bucks a month and we would have use of the extension cord. And she would cook food on a, a, a space heater. She would put wow. the heater up, face up. Back then, you know, 80s, so it wasn't as safe as they are now. Like, now they would stay lit, they would stay lit up if you had it face up. And she would use it as a stove. She would have a pan and she would cook food on top of the heater you know that wow. was my reality you know so for me when i watch tv my goal was to always have that kind of family life mm. that i used to see on tv to me that was making it tell me about laughter and comedy in that setting growing up what was that like you know in your home we uh, my brothers and sister and i always talk about how we were probably the happiest back then you know, there was no, we had no idea. We had no idea about luxuries in life. And like, for me, I always tell people luxuries for me in the States is having health insurance. Like, I don't understand, like that's so far beyond me, you know? But as a kid, we would always laugh so much. And now looking back, we realized that we were laughing out of necessity. Mm -hmm. There were times when we wouldn't have electricity. We wouldn't have, you know, we were in the dark, you know. And because we were in the dark, we found ourselves telling each other stories and making each other laugh, not knowing that that was kind of, like, uh, it was a defense mechanism mm -hmm. to what we were doing. And really, even now when we're together, I think it's a habit where we'll start talking in the daytime and it becomes dark and none of us turn on lamps. None of us turn on a light. We stay in the dark because That's it reminds so us of growing up, uh, you know, in Texas. And I understand making your mom laugh was a big deal for you yes. as a kid. My mom, uh, my mom was an immigrant, had a very hard life. She was, uh, I come from a very traditional family in that the women were always raised to be wives, mothers. So we were always taught to cook and clean for men and, you know, never really have a career. My mom, when she left my, my father, had to work. And it was this thing where you could see, you could see it, it, a sadness on her face just from generations of ideas that are so outdated that she wanted a break from them, but she couldn't. Hmm. And every time that I saw that I felt like she was sad, I would try to make her laugh. And I always knew that if I made her laugh, I did my job. You know, so I would watch, 
American soap operas like The Bold and the Beautiful. And then I would, um, I, there was a character named Ridge, and Ridge would have uh, sideburns and like a cleft. So I would get her eyeliner and I would just draw on sideburns and a little cleft. And I would pretend, I would act out in The Bold and the Beautiful for her in Spanish, and she would die laughing. And like that for me was one of the biggest, that was, she was one of my hardest, one of the hardest crowds I've ever played, huh. you know? And uh, every time I remember her laughing, I still remember it now and it makes me feel so good that I made her laugh. And it's interesting that your passage to professional comedy also started with your mom. You were, you were, you were coping with the grief of, yes. of losing your mother and that kind of brought you to stand-up comedy. I was living in Los Angeles and uh, I got a call that my mom was sick and I ended up going back to Texas to take care of her. And actually, I went back to Texas because they told me she was on her deathbed. I went back to Texas, saw her, and uh, within three days she was great. She got better. And she told me that it was because I was there. Hmm. Then she asked me to stay. What am I going to do? I, Catholic mom, that's the biggest guilt trip. Like, you know I almost died. I almost died. But you showing up, I got better. But if you want to go back to L.A., that's up to you. I'm just telling you. I'm like, oh, okay. So then I stay. I take care of her. I take care of her till she passes away. And... After that, I just didn't know what to do. I, I was depressed. I couldn't go to therapy. I couldn't afford therapy. It, like, it, it was just so foreign to me that I started doing stand-up to talk about her. And I started doing stand-up because I remember seeing Richard Pryor do stand-up and talking about his childhood and how rough his childhood was. And for me, I thought, well, you know, maybe there's something there. So I started talking about my mom. I started talking about my family. And people started laughing, and that's when I realized that my family, as specific as I could get, the more laughs I would get by showing mm. an example of my family. And that's when you realize that, you know, there was something weird about, about me talking about the hardest part of my life that got me through it. And actually, you know, I, I kept telling myself, I'm gonna keep doing stand-up until it stops being fun. And I've been doing it for 12 years now. And it's that thing where I found that I healed from my mom's passing with stand-up, which was just like one of the biggest gifts that I could have gotten. So interesting. Uh, for those that are just tuning in, I'm speaking with comedian Cristela Alonzo. She's currently touring Canada as part of her Just for Laughs uh, comedy tour 2015. That hardest time in your life that you just described, moving back uh, with your sister to help take care mm -hmm. of your mom, is also the setting for your sitcom yes. on ABC. Uh -huh. Yes. Actually, so you right away went to the hardest time in your life. Yes. You know, I wanted it because... Um, I always thought that the best episodes of TV were the ones that dealt with the hardest issues. I remember growing up with Good Times. You know, the, the Norman Lear shows, I mean, Good Times, they talked about, like, child abuse. They talked about poverty. I mean, it, uh, and they made you laugh. It was these amazingly difficult topics, and they were making you laugh. And to me, when I got the idea for the show, I thought, what was the hardest part of your life? What and what would resonate with people? Mm. And I told and I told myself, you know, every time you see TV, it's always the same person. It's always a single girl looking for love. Like, oh my God, Mr. Right. Like, no, no, no. I what? If, I don't want Mr. Right. What happens then? Like, I'm not I'm not sitting around watching Pretty Woman hoping that happens to me. Like, oh my God, I just want to be a hooker that gets hired for a week. You know, like it just doesn't happen. You know. So I told myself the hardest part of my life, and also the one of the best parts of my life was when I got to go back with my family and live in this home with my sister with all of these different generations and all these different ideals where you realize that I was the outcast. I was the black sheep because I wanted to do stand up. I wanted to act. I wanted to, you know, and, you know, my family, my mom always told me like my mom always said my perfect, the perfect job for me was cutting hair. You know, she's like, <laughs> if you cut hair, I'll be happy because even in a recession, people's hair grows. So and that's common of the, of the immigrant experience, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. The, the survivalist, you know. Mm -hmm. And for me, in the show leading up to it, it would have led to my mom's passing, which I thought was a very important part of people's lives. And I wanted to show that when my mom passed away at the funeral, I was making everybody laugh, you know, and I was making, I was telling stories about her. I was, and, and I realized that that was actually one of the, the happiest days of my life because wow. so many people came out to see, to, to the funeral, to see, to see the family, to see us, that it was kind of like having a montage of everything that my mom's life was in one day. And every person that I met, I had a story about her and it made me laugh. And when I started creating the show, I thought, 
how great is that? I want to talk about that. To me, I, I think it's more interesting to talk about the difficult things and make them funny than try to get the, the boring and, you know, the boring and the tired and make it new again. What I love about the creative challenge of a sitcom, too, is not only do you have to take that stuff and make it funny, but you also have to make it universal somehow. Absolutely. You know, what well, I always tell people, uh, people say, your show's a Latino show. I'm like, no, it's a, it, it hap my family happens to be Latino, but we're also Catholic, we're also blue collar we're, we're struggling families that you know, we're a struggling family that that struggles to pay bills and and that's a reality that's what people understand that's a big reality right now absolutely you know yeah. it's and that was the thing i wanted to show that everybody has that problem everybody you know it's funny i always tell people if you don't know a latino person or maybe you have a negative thought about a latino person if you saw the show it's always difficult to hate someone when you put a a face behind the mm -hmm. group that you that you don't like, you know, because now they become human. Now they become a person. It's hard to hate someone when you're sitting in front of that's them. That's the power of representation. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's kind of that. That's what this show started out for me. I wanted to represent a side, a minority that rarely gets represented on TV. It was so interesting to read your blog post after the show was canceled. Mix, a mix of feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you feel after that? You, you mentioned feeling relief. At the yes. same time, it must have been a huge, huge blow. You, you know, it, it was a big relief because it was so much stress. I didn't understand that being having a Latino show on American TV meant that I was representing every Latino out there. I can't do that. It's Latino, a massive burden. I, yeah, I mean, Latino covers so many countries, and people. There were people that were critical, like, "Oh, Latinos aren't like that." I didn't say Latinos were like that. I'm saying my family is like that. That's why the show's called Cristela and not every Latino in the world. <laughs> if I wanted to call every, if it was every Latino in the world, trust me, we would have had Dominicans related to Puerto Ricans. I mean, this is called Cristela, you know? Some people, some people would say, um, oh, you know, your mom on the show, they would say, uh, the mom on the show is so stereotypical. And I would always say, well, which one? My mom or my sister? Because my sister's my, a mom on the show too. Which one? Mm. And like the older one. I'm like, right but you don't think about the other mother, you know, because you're thinking so much about the older woman that you don't realize that there's a younger woman that's also a mother on the show. That's the point of the show. I'm showing that every generation changes. They progress, mm. you know? And it was that thing where I felt relief because I felt like I didn't have to represent everybody anymore. But at the same time, I was heartbroken that people I employed on the show didn't have a job anymore. I, I was disappointed with the fact that I still think we need representation that's more than just being maids or gang members. We need to show, we need to show that people have dreams. I mean, how easy is that? It sounds so simple, yet it's so hard to execute. Mm. To, you know, I would get notes, uh, like I said, my family's traditional. I would, tell, uh, I would want to do a storyline about my niece who can't play soccer couldn't play soccer because it's it's a, a guy's sport and yeah. she needs to be a girl and blah blah and the network would be like well but but girls play soccer uh, yeah i know that but but mine my niece couldn't That's so there's a lo lot of pressure dealing with those notes yeah. and, and all the other uh absolutely out outside outside pressures i love that you ended uh by saying that the show might be done but christella the person yes has has just started that's a beautiful note to end on. I wish we had more time to chat. I have so much more to no, ask no, you, no. but hopefully uh, we'll get you back in here. I would love to. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much, Christella. Thanks.